Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining me for this free mini online class, Abstract Approaches. My name is Tracy Verdugo and I am an Australian artist. Um, I live with my husband in a small coastal village about two and a half hours south of Sydney and um, it's the most beautiful bay that we live in. It's called Jervis Bay and a lot of my work is inspired by the beautiful surroundings here in the bay. I've put together this mini class for you, Abstract Approaches, as just a little glimpse into my teaching style and a prelude to my larger class, Abstract Mojo, which will take you on a whole bigger adventure into abstraction. So I hope that after you watch this class and uh, try some of the exercises that you'll join me in Abstract Mojo as well. Have fun! Hi everyone and welcome to your first lesson in this free mini class on abstract approaches. I'm Tracy Verdugo and today what we're going to be looking at is a method of working that I have come up with called embracing the contrast. Now, one of the best things about teaching, I find, is that even though I often approach my work intuitively, in order to be able to be an effective teacher and to be able to get my ideas across and help other people to understand, uh, you know, different ways of approaching these painting techniques, I often have to sit down and dissect the way that I work within my own pieces. Um, and so, you know, for quite some time, students have been asking me certain uh, questions about my abstract pieces. And I sat down one day and I realized that a lot of what I was doing is really pushing the contrast. And I don't mean just between dark and light. Um, there are many, many ways that we can add contrasting elements to our work. And so I began to play with this idea uh, in demonstration form at my workshops where we would deliberately um, put contrasting elements against each other and move our way around a piece using, using contrast as you know, our main tool to, um, to make the next move. And what I found while I was using this uh, technique to help my students is that we were less likely to get actually into um, those places where we'd be stuck, where we wouldn't know what to do next. So um, it quickly became one of my favorite tools to use and I'll be using it quite extensively in the upcoming Abstract Mojo course. In fact, we'll be dedicating, devoting a whole week to embracing the contrast and all of the ways that we can stretch that. But what I wanted to do today is to uh, work on uh, 15 small pieces to just introduce you to the concept of embracing the contrast. So it's not a super expensive sheet of watercolor paper and the reason I want you to work on just regular cartridge paper or just on some cheaper watercolor paper for this exercise is that I really want you to understand that it is an exercise. I think one of the things we get stuck on so much is this idea that everything we do has to be amazing or that everything we do has to be, you know, have some kind of successful outcome. Um, when you are learning new things, whether you are learning a language, whether you are learning to cook, whether you are learning to paint, you need to give yourself permission to explore and to make mistakes and you know to get rid of stuff um, but just to learn while you're doing it so you don't have to keep everything. Um, having said that, I'm not using like a super super lightweight paper because perhaps something good will happen on one or two of the pieces and I might want to keep them and push further into them. So before we get started, let's have a look at this um, idea of embracing the contrast and how we can use a list of words to help us make the next move, to help us always know where to go next. So I have a list in front of me that I've come up with myself. Um, you can actually write these ones down, you can feel free to add your own words to the list, but basically what I want to do is to create a list where we have words that either denote an emotion that we can express through art, or words that actually have an actual physical aspect. So for example, straight, as in you can do straight lines or curvy lines, etc, etc. So, with this list, I've got words like straight, big, loud, expansive, 
transparent, contained, messy, conscious, background, cool, dark, smudged, balanced, random, complex, bright, outside, detailed, thick, loose, dry, vibrant, white, textured, and curved. Okay, so that's quite a list. Um, so I really want you to, to kind of write those words down. Um, so rewind if you need to. And then I want you to write down in your mind, what are the opposite words that come to you for all of these words that we've written down. So for example, you've written down straight, so perhaps you might write down curvy, or you might write down bent, or you might write down crooked. We'll all have kind of a, a slightly different approach, okay, which is fantastic, which is where we want to get to. Um, so for example, if you've got the word messy, then, you know, for me, I might write down the word next to it, neat or contained, something like that. Smudged, the opposite to that in my mind would probably be something like clear or precise. Okay, so you're going to go ahead and you're going to write down all of the opposite words to the words that you have um, on this list. And we're going to use these opposites to actually move our way through the painting of all of these small pieces. Okay, so the other thing that you need to know is that I have a variety of uh, tools and um, mediums beside me. Not too much because I only have a small space right here, um, but I have several inks and they are De La Rowney acrylic artists inks. And I have several acrylic heavy body paints on a small palette with some white as well. And I have just a few things that I've picked up because in order to create contrasting elements, I need to have some contrasting mediums as well, okay? So I have a couple of oil pastels, I have some charcoal, I have a few different brushes, and let's see, so I have some willow charcoal and then a heavier charcoal as well. And I also have these fun I haven't actually played with them much, but these are play color art sticks and they're gouache solid paint sticks and they are actually, they make a great, a great mark. So um, let's get started. I have no plan for this lesson at all, except to follow my own prompts and um, to visit Embracing the Contrast on these small pieces. Now, usually I do this exercise at my workshops across one large piece and I normally do it also on the ground. So this is going to be a little different for me. Um, working my way across several different pieces and seeing how that pans out. So let's just take a look to get started and I'm just going to pick one word and the first word on my list is straight and so I'm going to grab a piece of charcoal and I'm just going to start at the far left and do a couple of straight lines. So the first thing that now comes into my mind is the opposite of straight and for me that would be curvy. So I'm going to just continue that line and take it over to the next sheet. And then think about what next. So if I'm looking at both of these lines, they're actually both quite thin, yeah? So this is how my mind is working. So thin, opposite of thin would be a thicker line. So I've just taken a little bit of the charcoal and I'm going to just pull it across on its side. And as I'm doing it and it's skipping, I'm realizing that a skipping line or a dotted line is another valid way of making a mark.
Or we could go for a thicker line made up by scribbling the charcoal across the page. I'm going to switch over to the heavier charcoal and just play with that. Still continuing to create line, trying to make the line just a little bit different across each one. Coming up here. Now one of the other words, I'm coming back, I'm just feeling then like, oh, okay, what shall I do next? So coming back to revisit, and the first thing I see is the word scribbly. Okay, so on this one, I'm just going to come ahead and just throw in a scribbly mark right there. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing on this one, but I'm going to place it in a different area. And I saw another word at the same time as I saw the word scribbly, and that word was smudged. So I'm going to just take a baby wipe and just smudge some elements of this line here. While I have the baby wipe in my hand, often I'll look at a tool that I'm using and then think to myself, well, there's still something on this tool, so perhaps I need to have a look and see what other kind of mark I can make by taking that tool and just wiping the residual off on the piece of paper. So just continuing along, let's have a look and just see. So something like if I look at the word contained, so I feel like, you know, if I did something like this with the charcoal, tiny, tiny little dots, That feels fairly contained to me. For you, it might be something completely different. If I think about the opposite of contained, suddenly I just had this kind of idea of jumping over from one sheet to the other. So escaping, escaping this contained element here. I don't really want two things to be the same, so I'm just going to take my little baby wipe again and loosen up this one here. So now we have depicted deliberate and kind of random as well, or smudgy and precise. So you see what I'm getting at here? So on the very last one, I'm just going to take the charcoal and do something different. And so now we have kind of a journey of visual elements and marks that have taken us the whole way across the 15 sheets of paper, but beginning to look at this idea of contrast, what does it mean? At a very basic, at a fundamental level, we've got contrast happening here quite easily because I've started with the black on the white paper, okay? So what's a move that we could make next? So I'm just looking down at the tools that I have in front of me and I'm thinking that I want to try a little bit of transparency. So. If we think about transparency and the opposite of transparent being opaque, it is probably best to work with something like an acrylic ink or a fluid acrylic to actually get some transparency going. And just for the purposes of this exercise, I'm going to add a little ink and then take a wet, wide, flat brush and just pull that ink down. While I have the ink on my brush, I'm just going to dip a little bit into water and make a different mark. So 
So I'm going to play with the idea of transparency just using a few different coloured inks. So reaching for the antelope brown right now and just in the same way Feeling that the energy of these marks right now are fairly random. I'm trying to dissect this as I move along. So for example, this mark that I've made just here, this one felt like it was more organic or round. And so I've placed the transparent mark above it kind of overlapping, but it's more of a square. So I'm thinking about this contrasting thing the whole time. Um, let's go for something quite dark. So this is Payne's Gray in the ink. And let's see. Hmm. I'm not gonna add it on this one because I already have a, a dark mass here. So I'm gonna add the Payne's Gray to one of the pieces that feels like it doesn't yet have a lot of oomph going on. So you can see that this application of the really dark Payne's Grey has a lot of strength. And that's the thing that contrast will give you, a lot of impact. Now you can imagine that when I'm working on the flat, I have a lot more control over what the ink does. So this is new territory for me. And I actually love that. I love the fact that when I'm teaching, I try to put myself in a similar place of discomfort as my students, if that makes sense. I try to make it so that um, I'm not doing the same thing that I always do, uh, you know, where I can predictably get a good outcome. I try and put myself in the situation where things might not go quite right for me. And then I have to figure out what do I do to solve that problem because that's all the creativity is really is just solving problems right so you know what do i do to solve the problem of the ink running down or do i just embrace these drips um what new thing will this bring to me all right just dipping that brush there's still a bit of paint spray on it so i'm going to dip it into the water and just apply it this one has a lot of curly, squiggly lines, so I'm gonna add some straight lines. This one doesn't have a lot on it at all just yet. Maybe I'll pick up some of the paint spray from here and do something quite different. So perhaps, you know, I'm thinking, wow, I feel actually like that maybe I'm overthinking too much. So sometimes what happens when I do that is I'll just do a deliberate kind of splat mark, you know? Um, <laughs> and just loosen things up a little bit. All right, so over on this one here, uh, and this one here, we don't have any transparency on there yet. So this is what we were looking at as transparent at this point. So I'm gonna just grab some marine blue ink and add that in. Not wiping my, I'm not cleaning my brush completely. I'll have a little bit of the Payne's Gray still on there. That's actually not marine blue ink. That is rounding blue, which is beautiful as well. Okay. You can see how bringing the ink through the charcoal actually creates a different color, a kind of a steel blue color, which is quite beautiful. And then I'm just gonna wipe the brush off in a couple of 
places as well. So one of the things I love to do if I have extra ink or extra paint on a piece um, is to work on the idea of perhaps putting in some smaller detailed elements, okay? So one of my favorite tools is a bamboo skewer to use for kebabs. And um, so I'm just gonna kind of move around and see where some of the ink is still slightly wet. And I'm just gonna pull it out to get some small kind of drawn elements which again, if we look at the words like bold and delicate, you could see like this being quite bold and then pulling some wet ink or even, you know, dipping your skewer into the ink and adding in some small dots with the end of the bamboo skewer is bringing in something that is a little more delicate against the bolder feel of the previous marks. Whenever I have something on a tool, a little bit of ink, I make sure that I take that and use it somewhere else. I'm just rolling that skewer across and adding another mark to one of the sheets. Okay, so I feel like we've gotten a pretty good flow and some energy and movement beginning to happen across the whole spread of these small pieces of paper. And what I would tend to do now would be to kind of come into individual pieces and to look at the energy or the feel of the individual piece using the word list, the embracing the contrast word list, and then making a move that is opposite to what is on there, okay? So for example, this little piece over here um, feels like it is quite one-dimensional right now. It feels like it's quite flat. And so I'm going to add a little bit of texture using a stencil. Um, and so I've just mixed up some heavy body paint, actually we'll do it this way, um, some heavy bodied acrylic paint uh, using Australian gold, I believe, and some white. And I'm just going to pull it across the piece overlapping the other two elements that are already on there which when you do it brings a sense of cohesion so it's actually coming in and overlapping two separate elements and bringing those elements together all right so while i have the stencil in my hand i'm going to use it in a couple of other areas um, so coming over to this little one here and the same way pulling the stencil over a couple of the elements that are already underneath. I'm not going for an exact stencil. Um, I'm actually going to just grab a little bit of turquoise now so I can change the color up a little. So just mixing that kind of mustard color with some turquoise. So that should get us a, a nice green. And you can see that I'm limiting my palette somewhat. Um, I haven't bought out every color under the sun um, because I think, I feel like it's already going to be enough complexity for us to try and work with so many different energetic words without bringing in the whole spectrum of color at the same time. Um, so I'm going to come up to this one here and bring in a little bit of stenciling texture with the green. So basically the colors I've chosen are in and around the greens, golds and blues. 
um, the antelope brown is kind of a, gr a greenish brown um, and then of course the blacks and the whites for that real contrast in light and dark. Let's take a little bit up here as well. And I'm not going to do the same repetitive element on each one. Um, so what I might do is just put that uh, stencil down for now. But while I have the green still on my brush, as I said to you before, I'm going to use that. I'm going to take a little bit of white with the green. And I'm going to apply some of this heavy bodied acrylic paint in different ways to several of these pieces okay so where where is that contrasting why is it contrasting because so far we have transparent and we have line we don't have any kind of opaque blocked in color just yet okay so there's another contrasting element for us to add to the piece so what about if i just take this one for example which has straight line straight line straight line curvy line curvy line curvy line transparent and then we just add in a block of opaque color. So suddenly you have a new element in your abstract piece. While I have the paint on my brush, take a little bit more white, and I'm gonna look for another piece that needs something more opaque. So coming up here, we have a skipping line, and we have some kind of splat brush marks which were quite random. So I'm going to connect those with an opaque circle. And I'm going to leave a little peek through to the underneath. So can you see what I'm doing? I'm just looking for ways in which I can add contrast, a contrasting element to whatever is already on the piece still have some on my brush so I'm going to come over this one especially feels like it needs a little something so I'm going to take a little bit more of the turquoise and let's do kind of a cradle here like a U shape that's cradling the other elements And then just to kind of get rid of the rest of the paint that's on this brush, I'm just going to come in here and just add a couple of elements. Just basically take the paint off the brush. Now when you're adding an opaque colour, one of the other things that you can do, which I love to do, is to take your bamboo skewer again and to just scratch through and bring an element of graffiti into the work. So this one has curvy line, curvy line, curvy line. And then I'm going to bring some straight, small straight lines scratched into that lighter opaque paint. And then scrape that white paint off and continue that repetition of that line down into the other color. All right, this is starting to look good. So I'm going to pick up one tool um, and sometimes that's also a strategy so that if you're starting to get overwhelmed with the piece that you're working on, pick up a tool and then let's see where we can actually use that tool using our contrasting list. So this one is um, one of those uh, gouache play color art sticks and this one is kind of a turquoise color and so just opening it up I'm going to have a look around and just see where can I actually play with this color. So first up looking at this piece right here um, I feel like it has a lot of um, curvy or swirly or um, undulating and it doesn't yet have a lot of straight. So I'm just going to come right over the top and just bring in some small straight strokes. So just one move at a time. So I'm going to look 
further along and just see where I can bring in some more of the same element but in a different way. So this piece right down the bottom here feels like it just doesn't have a lot going on yet, okay? It's fairly blocky. It's just one transparent blocked area and one scraped charcoal blocked area. So I'm going to take the line for a little walk around connecting those two areas. Okay, so there's a curvy linear element now introduced which is different than everything else that was on that piece. This one here, I feel like this would give us a nice contrast just in the color between this beautiful gold um, with the background of the um, antelope brown. So I'm thinking, you know, maybe just, we already have this kind of motion going on, maybe this one gets several straight lines all the way through it, okay? Just looking around a little bit more. This one feels quite contrived. It feels like, you know, I have these thick lines, thick straight lines going up and down. There's a dotted line which was just a drip of the ink from above and then there's this jumping. I feel like there's nothing on here that is um, scribbly or accidental so I'm just going to come straight in and just scribble on this piece. Okay, it feels really good when you scribble. Okay, this piece here does not have a lot going on either. Um, it, it feels like there's two disjointed areas so maybe, let's see, just join them up with a line. And then this one here, I'm just going to bring in some circular elements. And then maybe on this one, a repetition of the circle, but using a different material. So repetition is also another important element of um, an abstract piece. Now when we're looking at contrast in our abstract works, I want you to never be afraid to make a bold move a bold choice, okay? Because sometimes those are the leaps of faith that will just take you into another whole arena with your work. So even if you feel attached to something, even if you feel like something is really working, sometimes it's a, a good idea to just like do something completely different, to just like change it up, change the energy up. So I'm just kind of looking at my palette here and I have this beautiful lush midnight blue acrylic paint and I haven't yet used my finger as a tool so I'm going to actually come in and um, just bring in some really large contrasting areas on some of these pieces just using my finger and changing the energy up completely. Don't be afraid of really pushing the darks because you can always bring light back over the top of the dark um, and sometimes that's where you'll find a lot of warmth and a lot of contrast. Try not to judge the work as you're creating it. When you're making your pieces, they're exactly that. They are a work in progress. They're not actually meant to be judged. It's time to kind of judge them at the end. That's when you're going to be making the decisions about what you might need to add or take away in order to call the piece finished. But 
The making, the process of it, is not the time to actually be judging it. Pay attention to the energy that you're actually feeling when you're creating as well. So if you get to a point where you're feeling frustrated or you're feeling unsure, that's probably a good time to walk away. Um, what would be the opposite of frustrated or unsure? So the opposite of being unsure would be to have more clarity. So sometimes what you need to have more clarity is perhaps a break, a cup of tea, or to go and sit outside in nature, or go for a little walk, then to be able to come back in with fresh eyes and clarity to make the next move. So I'm gonna have a little break, have a cup of tea, because I'm just feeling a little bit unsure about the next move. And there's always, of course, a lot more pressure on me when I'm actually um, trying to teach you something. It's like, well, hopefully, the, the, um, the method behind the madness is coming through. So I'm just gonna head outside, have a little break, and then come back in. The standing back and kind of looking and assessing is also a part of the process. So give yourself time to do that as well. Um, it's interesting, working in this way, as I mentioned before, usually I would do this uh, whole demonstration on one sheet. And I'm noticing that having so many smaller pieces is, it's a whole different kettle of fish. It's a little trickier um, because my mind is like trying to solve multiple things. So, which is fine. Um, but what I'm gonna do is just step back for a moment and then I'm going to have a look at which pieces I feel are actually um, looking like they are more successful, even though we're not needing to actually have, you know, a complete successful piece. We are just playing around with these ideas of embracing the contrast. Um, it's nice to actually be able to look at together which pieces are working and which pieces would need more work if we were to push forward with them. So what I want to do right now is just stop where we are and I'm going to use a tool that I love to use to um, explore whether a composition is working or whether it needs to have something else added to it. So this is just a simple uh, viewfinder made from two L shapes and basically I use this um, on larger pieces as well. Um, I'll use it around a canvas to see which parts are working well and which parts are not. Um, and I'll use it on these smaller pieces as well to kind of give me some clarity about you know what is uh, working as a successful composition. And I really feel like something with this one is actually working quite beautifully. Um, and it could be that it doesn't need anything else. So um, I'm gonna kind of refrain from adding to this one. The one next to it, this one here, I feel like it's definitely gone too heavy on the dark and that I probably will need to come back over some of that dark with a little white. Um, and how I do that um, will be a decision. Possibly um, I may come in with some white gel pen, some specific patterning, because everything that's on there right now feels fairly random except for the stenciling. But even that is not, it doesn't feel deliberate. It feels kind of accidental. So I may come in with just some kind of deliberate mark right in this, in this piece here. Um, this one I feel like um, definitely is lacking in contrast. Um, could definitely use a little more oomph in the dark. This one I feel like has a long way to go for me. Something simple about this one is appealing um, and I'm enjoying all of the, the different elements and how they're working together. It doesn't feel like me, but that's okay. It's okay to stretch yourself as well and to do things that don't feel like you. Um, just to kind of um, experiment and push your own boundaries. This one I'm actually really enjoying. Um, I feel like for me it might need a little bit more contrast, so I'll look at that. This one... Something doesn't feel right for me yet with this piece nor that one. Something a 
about this one. I kind of don't mind the simplicity of that one. This one for me definitely needs something more. And this, more light needed in here. And definitely more in here as well. But again, you know, these are all um, personal um, decisions that I'm making about my own work. So, you know, coming back to this list um, can be a great way to just keep moving forward. So I think on a couple of them I mentioned that I would like to add in a little more contrast. Okay, so if we look at this one up here, I'm going to take just a piece of... Um, foam core, it's called scratch foam, but it's just basically, you can buy it from Dick Blicks or from art supply stores, it's basically a thin sheet of foam and it's um, very much like the foam that you'll find on the bottom of a meat tray or the bottom of a pizza tray and you can actually etch into the foam and create a pattern and then um, dig a little deeper so that you, in a, essentially you're making your own stamp. So I'm just going to add in a little element of pattern using the scratch foam and at the same time I'm going to push the contrast in this little piece above here and so we're just going to, I've painted some white paint onto the foam and I'm just going to push that paint down and then pull it off and you'll see this little kind of pattern contrast, beautiful contrast area happening there. So while I have that in my hand, I'm going to look for another opportunity to use it. While I have the turquoise on my brush, once again, I'm going to look for an opportunity to use that. It's actually been sitting in the water and so it's now a mixture of heavy bodied acrylic paint and water and I'm just going to add a circular element to this piece and kind of enclose or unite some of the elements underneath. Bringing that watered down acrylic paint. And you know, there's nothing wrong with if you actually try something or make a move, as in this circular element, that you feel really works well, then try it somewhere else. Try it on another piece and see how it feels there. For me, Adding that kind of oval circular element to this piece actually works even better than this one. So I actually feel like it just really made this piece here. And it may be that this one is done. Well, I still have the paint on my brush. Let's try it one more time. Sometimes you'll need to give yourself some space between one session and the next, especially when you're dealing with multiple pieces. Um, so depending on um, yeah, how you're feeling, sometimes the best thing to do is to walk away. Often though you'll have some paint left on your palette um, and acrylic dries very quickly. So um, one of the things I like to do just at the end of a session, even if I'm not quite sure where some of the pieces are going, is I'll just add some white to my palette and I'll just play with deliberately creating some more neutral colors uh, by mixing some of the colors that are actually left on the palette. So I'm just bringing together a little bit of white, 
and a little bit of that um, kind of gold, Australian gold, a little bit of turquoise and I'm going to play around with that colour almost as if I'm just creating some little swatches. But as you can see in doing that I'm adding another element to the piece. Playing with the application I could scrub I could scribble coming back in grabbing a slightly different mixture trying a different element Adding a little bit of the midnight blue so we get some greys happening. Grey can be a beautiful unifying element of a piece. It's a beautiful grey green happening there. Adding in a little more white. This piece is getting slightly murky, so pushing that light. I'm coming in with a, a bold move over here, just to kind of change up the energy on this one because it really wasn't doing a lot for me. I'm feeling a certain freedom with this white in my hand. So I'm kind of coming through and adding that in some other areas also. White is often the very last element that I will add to a piece. Moving across my palette and really just using what is left on here to make some moves before I finish up this session for the day. So I'm really happy with how some of these small pieces are coming along. Um, some of them, again, feel more successful than others. I feel like I need to take a step back, have a break, and just come back into the studio again tomorrow with fresh eyes, and then you know reassess where I feel pieces are balanced within those contrasting elements. I think it's important for me to let you know that when I talk about having a balance of contrasting elements, it doesn't mean having 50-50, like half dark, half light. Um, there's always going to be 
um, more of one contrasting element than the other. If we think about the rule of thirds, um, then you're probably more likely to have two thirds of the piece feeling dark and one third feeling light. Um, there's going to be feel more of a balance within that than just having a straight half half. Or another example would be to have a look at how many of the marks are bold marks and how many are delicate marks. If there was exactly half and half with bold and delicate, it probably wouldn't be as successful a piece as if there were more bold and less delicate or more delicate and less bold. So um, yes, let's leave it here and um, we will come back to them and I'm excited to see where we go next. Well, hello and welcome to the next segment of Abstract Approaches. I've decided to actually change approaches this morning and that's something that I do a lot in my teaching and in my work. So I figure that if you're new to uh, learning with me, I may as well just lay it out on the line right now that I often work very spontaneously and I work in response to the things that are going on around me. So if that's in an in-person workshop, then often it will be like the energy of the group or a particular person that I sense needs something um, so that I will actually you know create a demonstration or a technique right there on the spot to help that person get through whatever it is they need to get through and in turn that then helps the rest of the group so it's kind of how I work I don't really plan things out um, I have a basic loose structure of what I'm going to be teaching but then I'm really open always to um, just wherever the energy takes me, spontaneous happenings, accidents that can turn into amazing discoveries, um, just inspiration from the environment is really important. And so these are all things that we're going to be talking about when I release Abstract Mojo, which is the huge class that's going to be covering so much more um, than what we can do in these two lessons. But this is just a little taster for you all, and so I hope you're enjoying it. Um, so here we are out in my garden. It's springtime in Australia right now, so you'll hear lots of birds, um, and we have beautiful bottle brush uh, flowers in bloom and um, I just thought it'd be lovely to sit out here and chat with you for a bit. <clears throat> so we finished up in the last segment with a whole wall full of small mini abstracts and we were working through um, the embracing the contrast um, ideas of you know uh, looking at the flow and energy of what we have already going on in a piece and then seeing if we can add in something that was a contrasting element so for example we looked at whether there were too many bold lines in a piece and then added some delicate lines or we looked at if the energy was flowing or too loose then perhaps we might need to add in a little bit of structure so I hope that you got the gist of what what I was coming at with that um, and I will be exploring it a lot more there'll be a whole week devoted to embracing the contrast um, in the new class so what I decided to do this morning coming out and looking at all of these pieces on the wall was to actually take them off the wall because I didn't feel like I could resolve every single one of them in a mini class. Um, that would just take a, a whole lot more time, I think. But what I wanted to do, and as I mentioned to you earlier, this exercise was not really an exercise to get us to a point where we had 15 successful pieces. I really wanted it to just be a way for you to explore this idea of embracing the contrast. And as a new, um, idea to work with and then just to see where it would take you so to not be so attached to everything coming out you know as a magnificent success um, so I'm happy to leave these most of them where they are but I want to pick just a couple of them and I want to take them one step further for you so just to show you a few other techniques that I might use to either bring a bit of cohesion to a piece that's lacking in cohesion um, a bit of unity or perhaps just to take it one step further um, or to actually transform what is on the piece at the moment so and that's something I love to do because you know you sometimes we get stuck um, often I think that's one of the main things that students will tell me um, is that they get to a place with their work and they just get stuck. They don't know how to take it any further and what happens then is that 
stagnation sets in, right? And you lose your momentum. So you just can't keep going because you're actually fallen into this pit of stagnation. <laughs> it sounds terrible, but that's what happens. And then you're like, oh, you know, I'm just going to stick it in a corner or put it in a drawer. And I just don't know what I'm going to do with this piece. Often that happens on large canvases because of course there's a lot more space to fill. There's a lot more to figure out, a lot more problems to, you know, work out and resolve. Um, so I think sometimes just working small on little pieces like this is a really helpful way to move through and develop um, different strategies to kind of deal with similar problems that will come up even in your larger pieces, if that makes sense. I hope it makes sense. Um, so what I'm going to do is we're going to head back into the studio and I'm actually going to work on the flat um, now because I want to have a little bit more control over some of the techniques that I use so I'm not going to be working on the wall um, you won't see my face but you'll hear my voice and so we'll actually be working on several of these pieces on a table and I'll be taking you through some of the ways that I could make the next move to resolve some of the issues that we've come up with so we'll be looking at transformation we'll be looking at um, again, you know, balance and embracing the contrast. And we'll be adding a few more techniques, um, such as um, looking at glazing uh, briefly and a little bit of collage. So um, let's go have some fun and let's see what we can do with a few of these pieces. I will also be taking one of these pieces, uh, the one that I feel is the most resolved at the end of this lesson, and I will be taking that forward into the new class, Abstract Mojo, and we will be creating or recreating or using that piece as a jumping off point, as an inspiration for a large work on canvas. So I'm really excited to kind of take this into the, the larger class as well. So, Come on over, we're going to head into the studio and I'm um, going to have some fun. Okay, so I've chosen this little piece to begin with and this is probably one of the ones that I feel um, is working um, in the best way so far. And what I wanted to do with this one is just show you how sometimes adding a little bit of a collage element will actually really um, bring something new to the piece. So um, we'll be adding a little design. Um, I'm using some uh, just basic matte medium. So any kind of gel medium or matte medium will be um, handy for this, um, for this part. Uh, so we're just going to use a little bit of the matte medium basically as our glue, as our collage glue. And one of my favorite things to collage with is, um, we call them serviettes here in Australia, but I know a lot of people call them uh, napkins in other parts. Um, so there are lots and lots of beautiful patterned napkins that you can get your hands on. And all you need to make sure of is that when you're about to collage with them, that you actually just have a look and see whether there are two or three ply to your napkin and you want to take all of that backing paper off so that you're just ending up with the one layer that has the design on it. So I've chosen um, a napkin, a pattern napkin that, that has colors that kind of work with, they're in the same color family um, as what I have going on here on this piece. Um, and so I also wanted to illustrate that um, contrast is also about size. So I'm going to apply three pieces of this same patterned napkin, but I wouldn't go ahead and just apply three large pieces that were exactly the same shape. So we want some diversity within the work as well. So just to make it easy, I've kind of torn three pieces that, that um, are large, medium and small, okay? And then just you know, spend some time kind of moving them around and seeing where they might feel right to you. Often one of the ways that I'll work is I'll, I'll work with the initial large piece because obviously that's going to make you know, quite a lot of difference to the piece that you're working on. So I'll find my placement for that piece first and then I just use a little thing in my head that I have where I take the next piece and I, I just take it somewhere to the diagonal opposite. Okay, So I've got this piece here 
this piece, perhaps somewhere over here. And then this little piece somewhere within the mix, but not on the same plane as either of these. So what I mean by that is I'm not going to have it like coming to exactly the same place as this one or the same level down below as this one. I'm going to put it somewhere kind of in the middle. And the other thing I like to do when I'm working with the paper, with the napkins, with collage, is sometimes just find a part where there's like a harsh edge. So there's an edge here between the green and this other um, Payne's Grey ink underneath and just break that up a little bit by placing the piece where the two lines connect. Then I'm going to add one more piece of collage and this is just a piece of um, Chinese script and I'm going to maybe use this to tie together, let's see, tie together two of these. So just a slight overlap. We'll move this around just a little bit and I think I'll overlap in that way. So this is kind of a linking um, element between this piece of collage and this piece of collage. So let's see how that works when we pop it on. I might move this up just a little tiny touch more. Or down. Nope. Up. So you're going to use just a wet brush, a clean wet brush, and I'm going to actually glue down, let's see, I'm going to glue this one down first, and then I'm going to overlap the Chinese script and then overlap this one on top. So just a little bit of the matte medium underneath where your collage is going to go. And then take your wet brush that still has a little bit of medium on it and just run it across the top. Don't press too hard because the napkins will start to tear if you press too hard. So I'm going to actually overlap this one here. Just adding a little bit of the matte medium, placing the collage element and another layer. So this is a piece of text from a secondhand book. So it's going to act in a different way. It's a little bit more robust than the napkin. And then last piece just up here. So you'll see that the book page sits on top of the piece whereas the napkins kind of integrate into the piece. And you can try those out and just see, you know, which one do you prefer? Um, I think they both have their place in a piece. I generally prefer working with the napkins, but in this case, I feel like this adds a nice little element of difference as well. So you can see that's just brought a little bit more cohesion to this piece that we're working on. I'm going to put this one aside for a moment and then we'll come back to it once this collage has dried and we'll add another layer to another one of the pieces. Alrighty, so with this little one, I have to be honest and tell you there's not much here that is um, calling to me at all. There's nothing really that feels... Um, I don't know. I, I can't really find the sweet spot. And oftentimes what I'll do when I'm working is, you know, there'll be a certain element of the piece that's speaking to me and that's giving me somewhere that I can move forward from. So with this little one, it's like, eh, okay, nothing's really happening. So sometimes what I like to do when I'm at this point is to come at it um, with what I see as like a radical transformation. Okay, and I find this exhilarating and I, I know that it can also be quite terrifying because um, I've seen that in my students, but I promise you that once you've done it a few times, um, you'll catch the exhilaration, you'll catch that element of excitement and you know, it's about not knowing what comes next. So oftentimes what I'll talk to my students about is living in a state of curiosity but being more on the side of 
Um, playful curiosity rather than anxious curiosity. So the two words I often think about are, are what if. What if I try this? What if I just did this? What if I added this? So you know, try and be in the state of what if, but have this kind of anticipation that the what if could bring something new and amazing. It doesn't always happen, but when it does, it's fantastic. So what I've just put on my palette here, you'll notice are three very um, different colors than what we already have on this piece. So we've been working primarily with cool colors over here. So I've just brought in some warmer colors, some flame orange in the acrylic ink, some quinacridone magenta in the golden fluid, and some nickel azo gold also in the golden fluid. And I'm gonna use these to radically transform this little piece to give it a whole new feel by just pulling a glaze over. And so these um, paints and inks lend themselves to transparent glazes quite beautifully. And a glaze will help to just unify what's going on underneath. Um, now, if you like, you can use water to bring, to actually add into the paint and to thin it down just a little bit more. So I'm just adding some of the matte medium in. Um, so you can use the matte medium or you can use water to do the same thing. Uh, if you're working on larger pieces especially, uh, it's probably better to use the matte medium. So let's just pull over a glaze of the magenta in one area, the nickel azo gold in another area. Just noticing, you know, what, what happens when we do this. You'll see that as the piece is transforming in front of your eyes, it may be that you want to keep a little bit of what was underneath. And often that happens, so don't just go crazy and like pull the glaze across all at once. Notice what's happening as you apply the glaze. Notice how the things and the colors and the shapes underneath change in relationship to what you're doing. And I think I might just keep a little peek through to a couple of areas. Just a couple of geometric areas kind of peeking through from underneath. And that feels quite beautiful to me now. Um, definitely feels more resolved than it did before. I might like to intensify the magenta. And so you can always add in a little more of the colors that you're using. So just bringing in some areas slightly deeper glaze warming it up just that little bit more and even just trying out different orientations to see whether it might feel better one way or the other oftentimes when the color is deeper at the bottom it feels more grounded to me to actually turn the piece around. So while we have this one just still in front of us, um, I feel like we could probably bring some resolution to this fairly quickly. Um, perhaps just by adding in a little bit of contrast with um, a white gel pen. So coming into perhaps this darker area here and bringing in some small drawn elements. And then playing around with how would it feel to leave those drawn elements exactly where they are, or how would it feel to connect through from one area to another? 
So let's try that. It's coming down, bringing a little bit of that drawn element down and connecting it through to another section of dark below. So this is essentially a bridging technique where you're actually joining one area to another using a common element. And of course you could take that through to the next section or you could leave it just here or you could actually extend it and have a repetition of that mark in another area. So I like the way that's feeling. Something about this up here, um, the charcoal on that very first layer, it's just bothering me a little bit. What it feels like it's doing is it feels like it's taking my eye and leading my eye off the page. In fact, these drips up here also kind of pulling my eye all the way around and off the page. If I turned it around, it may not feel like it's doing the same thing. But one thing that I could do would be to just push that back a little bit, that top corner. And one of the tools, well not really a tool, but one of the things I love to use to do this is just to use a little bit of the white ink and just come around with an irregular border. Knocking that corner back a little bit and just strengthening the white around the edges at the same time. Nice clean brush. Sometimes just leaving a little bit of a, a glimpse through or pulling the white down in some areas. Leaving just a few little pieces to peek through. Maybe letting go of this corner quite a lot if that's the, the corner that's kind of offending me. Just leaving a couple of little peek throughs to that dark edge. That's better already, isn't it? Coming down here. Smoothing that white around the edges. Coming into just a couple of areas so that what we have happening around the edges is not completely different to what's going on inside. And what I mean by that is we do have some white on the inside, but this is the paper. It has a different feel and consistency than the white ink which is more like a veil that we've just placed around the outside. So I want a little bit of that veiled feel kind of inside the piece as well. And it can be quite subtle. Okay, so you can see just with that addition of the white. Maybe we'll just add a little bit through here. This piece feels a whole lot more resolved already. In fact, it may even be done. Let's have a look. Lots of yummy things happening in there. Different textures, details and expansive areas. curvy elements and linear elements, rectangular and circular, contrasting colors in warms and cools, small detailed elements and bolder, larger designs. At this point, I would put it aside to dry and then just reassess whether there needs to be any more balance, but I'm really loving it at the moment. 
this little area here where I did the one last thing, mm, not so sure if that's working just yet, but I'll let it dry. And if I want to intensify the magenta again, I can do that with a magenta glaze after the white is dry. If I start to fiddle with it now and bring the magenta glaze back in over the top, then it's going to turn pink because of the white that I have underneath, which actually could work as well. Let's try it. Why not? Let's just bring a little bit more magenta over the top and see how the addition of a little pink would work. Yeah, I think that's working quite beautifully. So let's put this one aside and very, very happy with where that's at. Okay, so let's come into this little one, which um, this one had a lot of elements to it that I was really enjoying at the end of the session yesterday, but it doesn't feel like, um, it feels like those elements are kind of separate from each other in a way, and especially this large block of white here with the scratch circle through it. So look, while I have um, a little bit more of these colors on my palette, I'm just gonna go ahead and throw a glaze and use these colors up and just see what happens if I pull a little of these warmer colors. So let's just go straight over the top Tone that white down. You can see how that brings up the texture. In fact, let's do this. Let's just bring this nickel azo gold. There's a little bit of magenta left on my brush. Let's just bring it down across the whole thing and see what happens when you pull a glaze across an entire piece in order to unify it. At the very least, it gives you a place to move forward from where everything in the underlayer is now cohesive. And sometimes just doing this can actually give you a beautiful piece. Let's just even let go of the green up here. Wow, I actually love the way that's looking. Now, if you wanted to, if you feel like you have gone too far ever, a couple of ways that you can bring parts back. One is to just use um, a paper towel and just rub back. Sometimes what you take away is just as important to a piece as what you put on. So we can put on the glaze, but then we can pull back as well. Um, another way to actually pull back is to take some alcohol, just some isopropyl alcohol, and you can draw into areas with that. Now, this is gonna give me some thin lines into that green. If you use more water with your inks and acrylics, rather than um, the, gla the glazing medium, if you use water, you'll get some really beautiful resist effects. And we'll look at that in some of the later works as well. So I'm gonna add one more additional element to this one. Um, and it's going to be a contrasting element to uh, what is going on in the center. It's looking very tribal at the moment. It's looking very cave art. Um, and I'm gonna try out a mixture of a brighter rowny blue and some Payne's Gray. I don't want it to be too bright. So you can mix these inks and you can mix them with each other and you can also mix them with acrylic paints. Okay, so let's take kind of equal parts Payne's Gray and equal parts Rowney Blue. And just get most of that nickel and magenta off the brush. And get your brush 
We don't want it too watery, so we want it to be fairly thick. And we're just going to take that nice, rich, deep blue that we've created and we're going to pull, instead of white this time, we're going to pull the darker color around the edges. Once again, I want to bring a little bit of that color into the mix in the center. If I've added something new to a piece, I want to make sure that it's integrated um, into the piece. So I don't want it to like be sticking out as if it's something completely different around the border. So you have to be in this spirit of trying things. So for me, that move didn't really, I don't know, it didn't resolve the whole thing for sure. Um, to me now it just feels like another move. It did something but it didn't resolve or it didn't add anything or enhance anything that's on there. So now I have to let that dry and I have to come back in and see what else I could do. One thing that I could do, let's just have a look at this. Let's turn it upside down again. One thing that I could do while I have this color on my palette is to see if I can add in perhaps some elements of a lighter blue. So using this blue that I've created, adding in a little bit of white ink, dry brush, mixing it around and seeing what would happen if I bring that lighter element in to the piece. So that definitely adds something. Maybe bringing that lighter element around the edges instead of the dark. Keeping some of the dark and adding a bit of contrast. That feels better already. Don't you think? Definitely feels better. All right. And then what I'm feeling, and this is of course, you know, we're all different in the way that we approach things. For whatever reason, I always love to push the light and dark. So I'm going to play around with a little bit of pure white right now, just on the edges of this color. So it'll, it'll be just an almost white. It'll have just a tinge of blue to it. And I'm going to bring a little bit of that color into the piece. Once again, kind of leaving some areas peeking through to the underneath. You'll see that because the edge is still slightly wet, you get a little bit of blending happening. Just making some organic shapes to kind of give us the little peek throughs to the underlayers. making these organic shapes, different sizes and shapes as well. And connecting them through to that center piece there, kind of scrubbing that white, that bluish white around that center area so that it becomes a feature, but it's also integrated. And just always deciding, you know, how far is enough. I could take this pattern and continue it all the way around, but then it would lose a little bit of what, what it has, whatever the magic is that it has. So I'm going to change brushes, take just a tiny bit more of that blue and just bring it down to meet the mid-tone blue here. And maybe bring it down to meet this section here. And then just mixing a little bit more white 
with that darker blue. I'm going to do one more lap around the border and just see how it feels if I lighten it up just a little bit further. Leaving a little bit of the darker and mid-tone blue. And yeah, I think I'm liking that contrast a whole bunch more. So if you wanted some very small details in this piece, you could then grab a gel pen or whatever you have on hand in the same color family. I have a Sharpie right here. So I'm going to see how that feels if I just add in just some small details. In lighter blue, down the edge there, and perhaps some tiny, tiny little dots up through this darker area here. So again, you've got your contrast light against dark, and I'm feeling much happier with this piece now as well. So coming back to this little piece with the collage elements, what I want to do is just a very simple, um, I'm going to keep the color harmony in this one, so I'm going to keep with the cool colors. And I just wanted to show you how we can actually use the um, fluid acrylic, so this is the turquoise and the golden fluid, to actually pull a glaze across the top of the napkins. Um, and just push back the design a little bit so it's still there it's still integrated in the piece but it's going to be changed up and pushed way way back so let's just pull this maybe add a little bit of matte medium I don't want to get any hard edges so we'll just pull this glaze around matte medium, adding a few more drops of matte medium as we as we move around the piece. So that we get a softer glaze on one side to the other. So our deepest glaze is where we started over here on this side. There's still some paint on my brush. Moving that around to the other side. I'm avoiding the middle because charcoal will always still smudge. Okay, so if you want your lines to still be clear, if you've used charcoal, oops, then you're not going to want to push a brush over those lines. But I kind of like how this is working. Now there are some brush marks. In this glaze, so if we come down here, you can see that you can see the brush marks. Okay, if you wanted to get rid of those, you could let it dry just a little bit. And I mean, they're not offensive to me, but you could let it dry just a little bit, and then you could bring in um, just a little bit of paper towel and rub back. A lot of the brush marks that you can see are actually the texture of the paint underneath. So just play around with that wiping back. You can also use a baby wipe to wipe back. So you'll just get a different feel if you use the baby wipe compared to the napkin. You still can see the design, but you now have this strong glaze over the top. You could also pull that back using a baby wipe. So let's just have a look. Actually, don't mind smudging up those lines a little. I like that. And now just for something a little bit different, we're going to keep this irregular border and rather than uh, bringing the white around it as I did with the other, I'm going to just bring in a drawn element with a loose scribbly line, taking my white gel pen and just letting my hand wander around the outside edges a bunch of times so that we create this kind of meandering line really just releasing 
the pan to do its own thing. And it will skip and it will hit and miss depending on whether you have wet paint underneath areas. And let it just do that. Let it just do what it wants to do. Just gonna come around a bunch of times here. It's just gonna give you something, just a different element again than the softer border. you want to scoot it around in one corner and create slightly more of a design element which is really nice and then if you like you can take a wet brush and you can just let's bring you in a little bit and just show you take a little bit of the outer line of the gel pen just add a little water and soften the outer edges. My brush is still a little bit wet. Or, of course, you could bring in a little of the white ink and just clean up a couple of the edges, leaving the scribbly border and just bringing in a little bit of the ink around the outside edge of the gel pen. Once again, if you're bringing in an element like this where the white is a lot brighter than the white of the page, then you're going to want to think about is there anywhere within the piece that you might like to have a repetition of that brighter white. At some point you notice, as I just have, that some of your collage element is lifting. Um, it's probably just because you didn't have enough of the gel medium on underneath in the first place. So just this little area here is lifting. So I'll just let that dry, then I'll add a little more gel medium underneath um, and get that glued down again. Um, and then perhaps because we've got such a strong element now of the gel pen around the edges um, it might be a, a good idea just to bring a little bit of that uh, gel pen into the actual design area of the piece as well in just a couple of areas so perhaps I could bring it through let's see it doesn't need to be a lot And I think I'm pretty happy with this one as well. So I do hope you've enjoyed um, this lesson. Uh, we're going to move on to looking at some apps. So just a really short introduction to how I work with apps to manipulate images to then create abstractions. Um, so I'm really excited about that as well. Um, and of course, this will be a small um, glimpse into uh, what will be a larger segment in my abstract mojo class. So I'm going to leave these three pieces where they're at. I'm really happy with how they've evolved. Um, so we've got this little one here with the, uh, the, the warm colors over the top of the cool. We've got this one here with the more complementary palette and this one here that had that kind of earthy, rusty feel and then we've actually brought in the complementary blues. Um, I hope that I've been able to show you um, some things that you didn't know before. I hope that you've enjoyed the abstract approaches and using the embracing the contrast. And I'm going to add one more class into this, um, this free mini class for you and we're going to be looking at apps and how I use apps to um, come up with ideas for abstract paintings. Um, so this will be a mini glimpse into, um, into those techniques. So you can look for more of these techniques in my abstract mojo class uh, and 
I hope you have fun with it.